Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome Dr. Atul Gawande, Assistant Administrator for Global Health at USAID, the world's premier global development agency on U.S. efforts to address global health challenges. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. Our guest is an accomplished surgeon, entrepreneur, and author. He even received a MacArthur Genius Award. He's now putting his considerable talents to overseeing the global health programs for the United States Agency for International Development, known as USAID. Dr. Atul Gawande is the USAID Assistant Administrator for Global Health. The U.S. government is the largest donor to global health in the world, and Dr. Gawande is the point person on that spending. Uh, a little bit about your comments about the role I've taken on in leading global health is that the, uh, that the role involves having, I have 2,500 people um, dispersed around the world who are, whose job is to help respond to crises. Uh, and those can be outbreaks of all kinds. In the last few months, we've not only dealt with monkeypox, we had an outbreak of, um, of Ebola in, uh, in the Democratic Repu Republic of Congo, loss of fever. In Guinea, Marburg virus, which has 88% mortality and behaves like Ebola, but does not have a vaccination um, uh, or treatment, uh, and two cases of that in Ghana. So, you know, when I think about outbreaks and their potential, um, uh, those are included in the kinds of areas that I'm most worried about, even as we're uh, addressing monkeypox. What matters is what happens long before it hits the headlines and what and how we contain um, and be prepared for these kinds of outbreaks. Well, Dr. Gwande, it would be a, a pretty vast understatement to say that your role is enormous and that the role of US uh, AID is enormous in the world. And just a few months ago, I understand you were at the Ukraine-Polish border. Uh, I wonder if you could share with us what you witnessed there and how is USAID responding and, and helping on the medical front of things with injuries and just the sheer level of trauma that people are experiencing there? Yeah, it's um, uh, the, the, the Russian government's war on Ukraine has had uh, devastating effects on people's health. And, you know, that has so many different dimensions. And my job has been to lead USAID's efforts to um, provide support to the government of Ukraine to enable keeping their population as safe and uh, and have a medical response that's functional, um, uh, make it as much functional as possible. And in the first couple of weeks, the situation they were up against and that we immediately dove in to help with was that 90% um, of the pharmacies closed. Uh, the supply chain for medicines almost instantly evaporated. Um, all of the liability contracts that had European suppliers driving trucks around the country, that disappeared with the force majeure, the force of the, 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 um, the war conditions. And so, uh, and then add to it that there came cyber attacks from Russia to try to take down the entire electronic record system and function of the of the hospital system across the country. Um, there was uh, supplies of oxygen were bombed on the ways to the hospitals. And so it was critical to provide support to the hospital system and the ministry there that ultimately got more than 5,000 humanitarian actors plugged into a common distribution system uh, where they could access information on what the core needs were and then cover supplies, um, have the, the routing set up. And we played a important role to providing assistance to enable some of those capabilities. And so within a matter of a month, it got up to 50% of pharmacies open. Now it's past 80% of pharmacies open in the areas that are not uh, under attack. The second has been moving the um, moving the electronic health record system into the cloud and having been through a uh, for those you know listeners in the United States having been through our uh, epic uh, upgrade to epic at my at the Mass General Brigham where um, I, I'm I've been on staff uh, until this role uh, moving you know which was a couple year rollout moving an entire country's electronic health record system to uh, to cyberspace and hardening it against cyber attacks 
unbelievable, unbelievable. And the teams that and the capabilities of, uh, that um, that I get, I'm fortunate to be able to have who can deploy that kind of capability. It's just a small indication of what's what we've had there. You know, we've seen, in addition, enormous public health needs from uh, uh, addressing availability of emergency contraception for the enormous number of rape victims to um, uh, to an out, you know, there's been outbreaks of, of there have been cases of diphtheria. There have been cases of uh, uh, polio that were being responded to. There were um, you go on down the list. Tuberculosis, multi drug resistant tuberculosis has been at already at one of the highest levels in the world in Ukraine, and uh, and then the the presence of uh, more than 10 million refugees internally and externally. Um, uh, has added to that. So that, that's the, the, the response has been tremendous, uh, a, as a partnership we've gotten to have with the Ukraine government. But the needs are, are serious and ongoing and taking place under, you know, tremendous instability. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that ongoing support is going to be, um, necessary for a while to come. Well, we, we've had the opportunity of interviewing a physician in, in the Ukraine and understand the real struggle they have and the appreciation for what our government is doing, uh, but also uh, identifying not only the health conditions, but the behavioral health needs that the population uh, is facing in this, in this war. And we also know you're very concerned about the skyrocketing COVID cases in the Ukraine as the vaccination rates have dropped What's the latest and how they're dealing with the pandemic uh, during the war it, amongst their many other challenges? Yeah, so they've been able to now restore supplies of vaccines, including COVID. Um, the uh, uh, and, you know, general public health response. Uh, another thing we did, for example, was um, we were able to buy a year's worth of supply for the 250,000 HIV patients who are on medication and need need the supplies of, the, of their medications to stay alive and gotten that into the distribution system. Uh, on COVID vaccination, we've ensured adequate supplies, and then the government has remained quite functional and maintaining primary health care clinics and vaccination services and capabilities. The, the challenges that Ukraine has long faced um, and that got accentuated during the COVID pandemic has been a high rate of, of uh, vaccine disinformation that has led to low rates of routine immunization to begin with, which is why they've been susceptible to measles outbreaks, um, uh, vaccine-derived polio uh, risk, and, um, and, and, and that has been no different under COVID. Um, when, uh, when they're under attack and when it's difficult to make basic primary care functions uh, be in place. Um, the uh, COVID is on the list of many things that um, the public has access, but the vaccination rates have remained low for lots of reasons, um, with misinformation being still part of that picture, but, but hardly the only part given the conditions in different parts of the country. Well, Dr. Guadia, I'd like to turn to yet another area uh, of concern, no shortage of them. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, obviously recently overturned Roe versus Wade. And we're hearing from international activists that even before this decision, countries that were receiving U.S. dollars were uh, hesitant of uh, uh, providing abortion services, doing anything related to abortion for fear of losing that money. And now uh, they believe that the court's ruling may have a chilling effect on family planning and reproductive around the world. Um, what's the administration's take on that? Is there any reassurance that we can give uh, other countries? I share the concern about a, a threat to people's, uh, to women's rights um, and threat to uh, those in the lesbian, gay and uh, transsexual uh, communities. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that are worth emphasizing here. First of all, the... Um, uh, our administration, the Biden-Harris administration, remains 100% committed to securing the reproductive rights, reproductive health, the sexual rights and health of the um, of the world's population, and uh, that means that we will continue to be defending those uh, th those basic rights and um, and enabling capabilities um, uh, to provide support. Second, 
we have long been under for decades um, restrictions that uh, that funding cannot be used uh, for abortion. Um, and none of the Supreme Court ruling has changed that. But there has been uh, sometimes, uh, as you said, uh, some instances of, of concern about a possible chilling effect. And we've I've been you know, in touch over the last several weeks to address questions and meet with our partners. Uh, you know, the United States is the largest supporter of family planning around the world. There's been bipartisan support for decades that have made us really the leading experts in how to ensure modernized forms of, uh, of family planning reach the world, making sure that uh, women have rights to uh, be able to uh, space their births, have, have the timing of their births be planned, and that voluntary family planning is a is a critical right um, that we have supported around the world. And um, and we're getting the same kinds of stories that you and have learned to manage and communicate about these stories in ways that we're just becoming familiar with now in the United States, where where the right to abortion has been eliminated by the Supreme Court. And that is the that um, uh, fear that women who come in with, say, bleeding or sepsis from unsafe abortion, uh, can they get appropriate medical services and are sometimes at risk of being denied. We have worked to communicate that post-abortion uh, services are absolutely necessary for our partners to be um, uh, providing and, and, and they're, they're able, to, able to provide that. Second, that women who are undergoing miscarriages, uh, bleeding-related miscarriages, in, incomplete miscarriage, um, need life-saving services and that th those should not be uh, withheld and, and maintain clarity throughout our system um, of support, funding, um, et cetera, that those are there. So those are just some examples of the areas where there can be risk of great misinformation um, and need to, you know, that misinformation or just fear or a chilling effect that can cost women their lives. And that is uh, exactly the fear I have about the 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 Supreme Court ruling domestically. Finally, I'll just say there's a lot of fear that we're hearing that uh, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. That um, you know, Clarence Thomas included in his uh, in his uh, uh, judgment that um, you know next the uh, the Supreme Court would look at um, the right to privacy over um, sexual conduct and over um, uh, gay marriage. And abroad, there's a great deal of fear um, in the LGBT community that this would um, affect their rights, sometimes in countries where we fight really hard to protect those populations. Their lives are literally at risk in many, in some, many of the countries that we're working to protect these populations, and we don't want to see them become even more endangered. Well, that's such an important message. Thank you for sharing that. And I want to talk a little bit about the investment that uh, American taxpayers are making in, in into global health. And uh, I think it was fiscal year 2021, $11 billion uh, was provided. And then I, I believe there was a, a supplemental of $9 billion uh, provided for COVID-19. And while we know this is a very small percentage of the overall budget, and some would argue it's too small, um, I'm wondering how you communicate uh, to sort of people on Main Street that they're really getting their values uh, worth in terms of the investment that we're making. Well, a, a couple of things. One, it's a lot of money. No, no question about it. Billions of dollars. And uh, being really clear that we want to fight diseases where they start. We want to enable people to live, um, uh, uh, to survive. Uh, and want to be able to make sure that um, our interconnections in the world that, you know, uh, um, that enable supply chains, enable jobs. We are we are one world uh, uh, that is deeply in interconnected and not just um, disconnected countries. And so we've had decades of bipartisan support, conservatives and and uh, liberals coming together. Um, to sustain work that has uh, made sure that HIV, for example, um, is uh, has declined in mortality and is beginning to be uh, increasingly controlled with countries 
reaching epidemic control. We've been eliminating malaria country by country from the world. We have a series of neglected uh, diseases from um, uh, elephantiasis, lymph lymphatic filariasis, to uh, liver cysts and other parasites that have uh, been able to be controlled. Furthermore, we've been not only one of the biggest donors enabling uh, women's rights and sexual rights and uh, family planning access in the world, but we our work with maternal and child survival has made it has been critical to work that ensures people live long enough to become productive members of society and healthy members of society that enables the prosperity of the world to grow. We've had year after year of steady reduction in uh, global mortality so that life expectancy has grown enormously around the world. What I'll point out is that we've just endured during the last two years the first reduction in global life expectancy in more than a century. That's how bad that has been in the pandemic. And only a minority of those deaths have come directly from infection by COVID. COVID also resulted, the pandemic resulted in uh, um, rising food prices that have led to acute malnutrition, led to uh, health workers uh, uh, not you know, being sick themselves and therefore not being able to provide services. It's made fragile health systems around the world even more fragile with mortality rates for under five children, under age five children, as well as uh, mothers at, at, in childbirth. Uh, those mortality r rates have risen for the first time in decades. And, um, and so part of our work, the critical part of our work, is ensuring that we are in a global community where um, what I'd say is we have discovered in the last century how to make it so that the average person can live 80 plus years of life. That has included uh, 6,000 drugs, 4,000 medical and sur surgical procedures, and a couple thousand public health interventions. And our job has been to deploy that capability town by town to everyone alive, even within the United States, we have large parts of the population that don't get the benefit of that capability. And being able to have, a, you know, this is a generation of work on our hands. Part of the reason I took this job is COVID made it clear how interconnected we are. And there are 2 billion people in low income parts of the world who simply don't have access to the basic medicines, the public health interventions that make it possible to have that lifespan and that kind of uh, productive contribution to society. And when we don't support and enable that capability to grow, we end up paying the price for it in many, many ways, from direct infection to our, uh, our own uh, political um, loss of support. Um, and so, you know, in politics, it matters, and then it, it matters economically, too. Well, Dr. Gwande, I think you've uh, just shown a spotlight on another critical issue, and that is the critical role uh, that healthcare workers play in making this happen, uh, in, in delivering the essential health services and, and contributing uh, to the health of the population. And to that end, I think uh, President Biden has rightfully said that the COVID pandemic put an entirely new spotlight on that issue. And the administration has pledged a billion dollars for a global health worker initiative that I understand uh, USAID will manage. Uh, please share with us your thoughts about this effort and how this effort will uh, protect and also grow the healthcare workforce internationally. Yeah, this is incredibly important to understand, but can be hard to wrap your mind around. You know, I came in with three core priorities that I wanted to accomplish. Number one was to make COVID into a manageable endemic respiratory illness. And that's happening. We have the arsenal in the United States, but we don't have that arsenal. Rapid, rapid diagnostic tests, antiviral pills, vaccines deployed for um, more than 2 billion people of the global population. Second is making us better prepared for the next pandemic and responding to outbreaks. We talked about that a, a good deal. And third is reversing the um, loss of global life expectancy. All of that work flows through one, it's the same workforce, and that's the primary healthcare workforce in particular, who are the backbone of the ability to respond um, and to address those, those needs. Um, 
And so whether we're working on any of those, it all comes down to, is there a frontline workforce of community health workers plugged into primary health care clinics where the workers are salaried and paid on time, they're trained at, a, uh, at an adequate level, they have the technology and support capabilities that they need, whether it's diagnostic kits or uh, basic tools, uh, and are they managed and plugged into a primary health clinic in an effective way? And where that's been deployed, I was in Ghana just um, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and in a, in a randomized trial that they actually conducted before deploying it nationwide, they found that they had a 50% improvement in, um, uh, 50% reduction in child mortality within three years, 70% reduction within seven years, um, that the fertility rate as family planning became available also improved. And that capability, deploying those that workforce capability is, is the single best investment we, we can make. Not so much to pay the worker salaries, but the, to provide funding that can enable everything from training. You know, we have played a critical role in making sure that there's adequate nurses being trained and school supported, uh, physician training for primary care, uh, but then also that the supply chain uh, capabilities are there that the um uh and that the systems are in place that enable all of that workforce to be financed managed and paid and do it in coordination with everyone from the world bank to the countries on the ground that work um is is crucial and that's why the president's commitment of the billion dollar investment which is on the one hand a tiny percentage of funding uh, of of you know payments for healthcare in the world, but it has a huge outsized Im impact that can um, that can leverage an enormous amount of um, uh, funding from countries themselves and uh, trained workers who will be a, a generation that can make a difference. We did this in South Korea at the time that it was a rural, impoverished community. We backed the training of the physicians and nurses there. Uh, we've done it in Costa Rica. And it's turned both of those communities into places with an average 80 plus year life expectancy and enormously more economic prosperity. Let, let me get in a quick question. Uh, your, your life and career have been dedicated to redefining, reimagining the healthcare delivery system, improving it. Now your office houses the Center for Innovation and Impact. It supports breakthrough innovations, applies market-based approaches, and advances efforts in digital health and human-centered design. What are some of the successes you're impressed by? Um, I'll give one example, um, and that's the oxygen program that the that the Center for Innovation and Impact uh, created. We saw when India got hit by COVID, people dying for lack of oxygen, and it has been a huge missing gap across much of the world. Um, you know, you can't do emergency C sections, you can't do uh, uh, newborn rescue. You can't, there's so many things as childhood pneumonia is the biggest uh, killer of children under age five. Um, and in COVID, you need oxygen. Uh, the team uh, was able to design uh, an approach that wasn't just about shipping oxygen, but about changing the markets for oxygen. People pay 10 times or more for oxygen in low income countries. Uh, the access to supplies aren't there. The factories aren't there. And so they have enabled uh, the distribution of the, um, the equipment to set up, you know, oxygen production, enabling uh, bulk liquid oxygen then to get delivered uh, and, and, and then piped into uh, key clinical settings. And that capability what was thought to be something you couldn't build and sustain a living ecosystem to make possible. Um, I've seen it now. I've seen it in, in places across every continent that, um, uh, that have had these, say, these setups put into place with training and support for the people who then maintain and can continue that capability. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not just about the breakthrough innovation. It's the follow through innovation. Oxygen we've had available for a century, uh, but how you can make it widely available in the world, scale up and bring that productive capacity 
to uh, millions of people. That's the remarkable thing that, um, that the center has been able to provide. We've been speaking today with Dr. Atul Gawande, the USAID Assistant Administrator for Global Health. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank you for your decades, career-long championing of health and healthcare for all. And thanks to our audience for joining us. You can learn more about conversations on healthcare and sign up for our email updates at www.chcradio.com. Dr. Gawande, thank you again and continued best of luck in this enormous role that you've taken on. Absolutely. For taking the time. It's been really great to talk to you. Great. Wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.